like all renal uh, physicians, uh, Damien Fogarty supports Arsenal. It's kind of uh, uh, what they do. They go, they go to the Emirates. Uh, he goes religiously. He's not only a distinguished consultant renal, renal physician here, but he's actually the third chair, in only 15 years, the third chair of the UK Renal Registry, which is, I think, probably lovely to see someone from here on that. And his one wish for the DHSS over the next two years is that there's an integrated, functionally appropriate IT system that we can all work from. Damien. <clears throat> thank you, Roman, and thank you to Gain for inviting me um, onto a soapbox. I hope I will have be a bit opinionated, so apologies if this doesn't agree with you. This is a cl clinician's view. Um, although I'm clearly very involved with some national priorities, I, I, I still see myself first and foremost as a clinician, an educator, and a researcher. I still try to do all three. Now, this is very topical because this was the, the, the Daily Telegraph uh, on Monday, um, and this was about hospitals told to publish surgery results in open source NHS. This is a cardiothoracic surgical audit, which has been going on since the, the Bristol inquiry, and names individual consultants and their performance. And um, it's interesting, you know, the, the, in it's fanfare that the health secretary is announcing 1.2 million of new funding to improve the collection. 1.2 million is minuscule in a 100 billion system. And for this to be a headline or fanfare like this in the Daily Telegraph just shows you how far we have to go in understanding the resource that is required to do <coughs> high quality audit. Um, 1.2 million is, is roughly the budget that we use in the renal services for national audit. And actually, it represents 0.005% of our total budget. Because I'll show you in the next 20 minutes or so how we do this very effectively using good IT systems. So why have national audits and registries? Uh, how does the UK Renal Registry work as an example of a national registry which does audit? Uh, the achievements of the registry, national audit examples, and how can Northern Ireland use these best? So it's always good to have a hands-up question. So I, I would like a bit of part audience participation. So hands up all those in the, in the audience who've been involved with an audit. We've all been involved with an audit. Okay, hands up those who did the same audit the following year. Down to 10. Hands up those who did the same audit the third time. Okay, two, three, fourth time. I think the GPs are winning here. They're doing the same audit every time, okay? Uh, it's called QAF, but you know, it's, it's labeled an audit, but it essentially is an audit. Um, and the point of that is it's very difficult to do the same thing year in, year out. We get bored. We all like to be challenged. We like something new, we like a fresh coat of paint. We get bored. So you need a system that will do this cheaply and effectively, and that's why IT is the solution. Now, this has been well recognised, and this is the, the Healthcare Quality Improvement Partnership, which Martin and colleagues will be familiar with. And this essentially is a regulator for national audit in, the, in England and Wales. And you'll see um, halfway down here, the national clinical audits are mentioned here. Okay? And one of the first things to consider is well, what is the difference between a clinical audit and a registry? Now, we have this very complicated. So, uh, system with buttons that we think is a woman, feminine side, and the male, very simple. But really, a, a registry, if you like, is the bottom half. A registry is a collection of many different tools, but from within a registry, you can answer a single audit question in the top half. And this is a list of the various national uh, clinical audits and registries. I won't go through them. I will highlight at the bottom the UK Renal Registry is there. Now we are not funded by HQIP, but we're certainly on their list of people that they're aware of. Um, and I suppose they, they let us go to it since we've developed our own systems. And that's what many of these national audits are. The cancer registries and audits are, are in here as well. But a number of these, I'll come back to the, the HQIP and a few of the specific audits that they fund uh, later. And the registry really is a way to record and compare activity. Uh, it can look at achievement of clinical markers of care. 
can outline differences between those units and more importantly explore those differences and affect change. This is the classic audit cycle that we're all familiar with. But as I've demonstrated to you today, most of us only do this a couple of times we move on. And we clearly, if it's important enough to do once or twice, it's important enough to keep doing. Of course, life is not going to be easy. Uh, this uh, you know, document, which applies largely to England and Wales, will filter through in its effects to, to us uh, in Northern Ireland. And liberating the NHS is a, the best euphemism for saying that there's going to be no growth in terms of funding. So liberating in that, uh, yes, you have to think of new ways, innovation, to, to continue doing the same work, but spinning faster in the wheel or working smarter on the other side. So how does the UK Renal Registry do this as an example of a national registry which does national audit? Well, it's fully electronic. There is no paper or spreadsheet return involved. Every renal centre, all 75 of them at the minute, in the UK has an IT system. There are about 16 different IT systems across the UK, but they all feed through a common defined data set, now up to about 400 items, that says this is what we want to collect. If you want to implement a renal information system, your system has to deliver on these 400 items. We don't really care where it is in the system, how it looks, but we need to be able to get access to those items. This allows us to capture this defined data set and it's grown to, to hundreds of items. And now you think 400 items is a lot. That's actually not that much. There's a lot more we could capture and there's a lot of those items we don't get complete coverage of. So we've still a lot of work to do. We've got data on every renal replacement therapy patient, that's dialysis and transplantation, across the UK and we extract them quarterly from those units. It's done electronically through an encrypted file process. It's sent to Bristol and there's extensive data validation there with a team of three or four. It's then passed to the statisticians who help produce the annual report for us uh, roughly every spring uh, of the year. Now we are working at the minute on the 2009 data, so we're not up to speed with the 2010 data. And one of the criticisms of registries is they are so big and complex, you can't immediately look back at what you did last year. But as you'll see, actually looking at the time trends over three and four years is probably more important than just the immediate last year, looking at the, that there's improvement. How is this funded? Well, every time a patient starts dialysis or has a transplant, the trust has to pay, the you to pay £19 pounds per patient. So roughly in Belfast, for about 700 patients, we pay about £20,000 to cover all of our audit and national audit. 15 years old, it is still functioning in about 20 to 30 percent of the UK units. It looks quite drab, it's like a spreadsheet with lots of lab data, but down the bottom right you'll see that there's different domains you can move to, biochemistry, hematology and so on. And now we've added in things like listing for transplant, uh, whether the patient has got a fistula and so on. So non-biochemical data can be entered in this as well, drug data. Many of my colleagues in England and Wales run their complete system using uh, uh, this electronic system. They try not to rely on as much paper, many of them still require paper, but they're moving towards electronic systems for day-to-day -day use. This is our system in Northern Ireland, and I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it service, I could talk about this for, for the whole session in itself, but this took us about five years to, well, three years to commission to explore and commission and get the right system. It's a regional system. When I go back to the, uh, the hospital this afternoon, I can look at exactly what is happening to dialysis patients in any other unit. And if there's patients transferred, the information is there. These, this is the particular lab data that's transferred across, and you'll see the, the dreaded EGFR for any of the nurses and doctors who dealt with this on the, in the bottom graph. So we use this, for instance, to show the patient to say, well, actually, your kidney function is stable. So it's more than just a tool for national audit or local audit. It's used as a, an educational tool to help inform the patient about what's happening to them. Uh, we've learned a huge amount through this. We still are working on improving it, and we've implemented it in 2003. And it's still a work in progress. It takes time and resource and effort to do this. However, from those data items, we send them down to the, the, the unit in Bristol and the analysis produces these annual reports 
which had got thick for some reason in the middle of the years and now I've got a bit thinner. And under my watch are going to be even thinner again because I've realised that people just don't read 300 page documents. Sorry Chris from NICE, I know I read the NICE documents, I'm one of the few people who actually reads the whole lot of it sometimes. But anyway, um, some of the important summary data which NICE is very good at doing, I'm just going to show you as an example of, of how we affect change. So in 1997, this was one of the first reports, the first reports, we demonstrated across nine units that there was quite a variation in median age. And the units at the top and the left were saying to the units in the bottom, what's wrong that you're not dialysing these patients over the age of 60? What's, your, what's the problem? And there has been a real culture shift in the last 15, 20 years, so that now age is no longer a barrier to starting dialysis. And this has shifted upwards, and I'll show you in the next slide, which gets busy, but you'll get the idea in the next slide that the median age of our patients has gone up. So this is an important policy change that has been affected by the use of a national audit approach. I will point out the treatment centres are labelled with um, a letter. A few years ago we thought it was very brave, and when on reflection it wasn't at all. Well, now we publish it with all the units' names there. And I, I think in time we'll end up publishing it with, if needs be, individual consultant names, if there's an individual consultant that can stand over something. Increasingly we work in teams, so I don't think that will happen. But in this, we can't quite see the 70 odd units. But if I'll point out over here, we've got Antrim down here, uh, Tyrone, and a number of others, there's Belfast. These are the median ages of our patients now. Closer to 70 years, and over 70, that's the middle, the median, the average age, and there's still variation that we're working on, but clearly we're collecting this across the units to highlight examples. For those of you who, who want to, if you like, highlight Northern Ireland's international excellence, Jim, we are, uh, are very proud of the fact that we dialyse more of the elderly than any other part of the UK. And we think that's because we've lots of units close to the, where patients need, need treatment, and we've actually, been very lucky in our resourcing over the years. We've got more consultants per million than anywhere else, and we're grateful for that help, but we think we highlight that with the greater resource, you can achieve greater, greater things. And you'll see later that dialyzing the elderly is very worthwhile. I'll come back to that. So we'll just show you a couple of other quick examples that should highlight how registers and audits inform national policy, regional comparison, local unit development, and I've even shown you already that there's individual patient level improvement by letting them see their information and records there. Uh, an international example of how registries are very effective is, is shown here in the difference across the, the countries. Poor Bangladesh, you may look at on the left hand side. Bangladesh is a, a poor country clearly, but uh, it was clearly thought, right, we're going to get involved with this international effort to, to map how many patients start dialysis. So they now come on to the list, they're bottom of the league, relegation places like Wolves and West Ham and all those other teams. So they're down there. But the most important thing about Bangladesh is that they've got the fastest growth of all international countries. Their rate of increase year on year is increasing. And clearly they're using the position here to drive the resources at a national level. This is the map of the UK units. We've got six units in Northern Ireland for 1.8 million. So we are well, well off in that respect. Uh, but we don't think we spend much more now on our units than we, we do compared to other regions. We collect uh, data on about 50,000 patients each year. And that's growing by about 4% each year. We look at very simple things such as the growth in the modality of treatment. So here you can see that the red bar, hemodialysis has increased to be the predominant way that patients have renal replacement. And this is important to help uh, guide resources. But it also highlights that in the early days, in the 80s, this white bar, we had many patients doing home therapies. And this was a major driver for the UK community to say, hold on a minute, we have to get home therapy. We need to have more home therapy. And we're hoping to see this white bar at the top, which is very skinny at the minute, increase in thickness over time. 